Okay. So uh, today in this talk, uh, actually, I will um, I will divide my talk into uh, approximately three parts. So the first part will be uh, just a kind of um, basics of exceptional points, kind of an introduction, um, just to get everyone on the same page and kind of introduction for the students maybe. And then the second part uh, will be uh, mainly based on this paper. And so uh, the main topic here will be dynamics uh, near exceptional points in quantum systems. So that's the quantum dynamics part of the talk in part two. Then the third part will be this archive paper, which then is actually the title, the coexistence of the exceptional ring and exceptional surface in a doped molecular chain. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So we start with the definition. Um, actually, let me turn this humidifier off. It might make ambient noise in the background. Um, so we start with a definition. So um, an exceptional point is a branch point in the parameter space of a given Hamiltonian at which two or more eigenstates coalesce. Um, a key point about the EP or the exceptional point is that the usual diagonalization scheme for the Hamiltonian breaks down. Um, and in particular, in the most reduced form of the Hamiltonian, you will have at least one Jordan block like this. Um, further, this is distinct from the usual concept of degeneracy in quantum systems. Uh, so uh, in the usual picture of the degeneracy, which is at the so-called diabolic point, um, you have two states uh, that share the same that share the same eigenvalue. So, uh, but the two states remain distinct; they're different from each other. However, at the uh, at the exceptional point, uh, the two states uh, share the same eigenvalue, but they also actually coalesce into one state. Now, exceptional points can only appear in non-Hermitian systems. And I'll say more specifically about that uh, a little later. Um, now, uh, another, another uh, key point uh, is that in the vicinity of the exceptional points, the energy eigenvalues and, and actually other physical quantities uh, can be expanded in the so-called PC expansion, uh, which takes this form here. It's like a, uh, it's like a Taylor series, but there are these, um, there are these fractional powers that appear. Now uh, notice this, this value ZEP bar here. So this is the uh, eigenvalue that the states will coalesce onto at the exact exceptional point. And I emphasize that I've, I've labeled this uh, coalescent quantity with a bar. And so that's what I'll do generally at the, uh, throughout the talk is I'll label um, uh, quantities at the exceptional point with a bar. Um, then further, we see epsilon EP bar here. Uh, we see that is the exceptional point. And it is, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's just a branch point in the epsilon parameter space here in the PCU expansion. Now, as an application uh, for, this, uh, for this point, the PCU expansion can be used as the basis for enhanced sensing near the exceptional points uh, as proposed uh, by Virzig in this paper. And one of the points that he further proposed in that paper is the the use of the uh, the use of this uh, enhanced sensing as a micro cavity sensor capable of single particle detection. Actually, we'll come back at the very end of the talk to something sort of conceptually similar. Um, now, another uh, another important property of the exceptional points is that the norm of the coalescing eigenstates diverges at the EP. Uh, however, a key point here is that the divergence will actually be uh, of opposite magnitude for the two states. 
And so uh, what actually happens is when you calculate physical quantities, of course, those have to remain finite. Um, uh, the physical quantities have to remain finite. So the uh, diverging contributions from the different states will actually, co uh, will actually cancel out. Now, as I said, the exceptional points can only occur in non-Hermitian systems. Let me say a little bit more about what I have in mind. So I have in mind basically two different pictures for non-Hermitian systems. The first picture is uh, an open quantum system. And now I claim that these, contain, these have a kind of implicit non-Hermeticity. So open quantum systems are typically used to describe how some uh, discrete quantized uh, system interacts with its surrounding environment. Um, and the, uh, so the discrete system has discrete energies, but the environment is described with an energy continuum. And now if you project out, if you project out the environmental part of the system, you, what you'll obtain is like an effective, uh, an effective Hamiltonian for the, uh, for the discrete portion of the system. And despite the fact that the original Hamiltonian was just Hermitian, when you, when you perform that projection, the effective Hamiltonian you obtain is non-Hermitian. So then that reveals a kind of implicit non-Hermeticity non to open systems. Now that's as opposed to ex explicitly non-Hermitian systems, which have been studied a lot um, in the last couple of decades. Uh, for a variety of reasons in a variety of disciplines. Uh, particularly, they've been useful for de describing uh, phenomena in optical settings. Um, and this includes PT symmetry, uh, pseudo-hermeticity, and, and, and concepts like this. Um, uh, I, from my point of view, I would say that uh, the explicit non-hermeticity can, in some contexts, it can be understood as a kind of macroscopic approximation to the microscopic degrees of freedom in the open quantum system. So uh, now in the explicit non-hermitian picture, let's say a little bit more about this. So uh, this is often described in, in terms of coupled mode theory, which assumes, uh, which assumes that the most important properties of the system can be described in terms of a few key interacting modes. So here is a simple example. Um, we, we assume you know, there are these two modes. They're both lossy modes. They have this negative part of the uh, uh, imaginary part of the eigenvalue. And uh, they're coupled together through this omega. And like I said, this, this minus I gamma can be understood as a kind of approximation for the, for the environmental influence in the, the true quantum description. Um, and then of course we can easily get the eigenvalues for such a system. We can see immediately when this, when this root vanishes, of course that, that is the exceptional point where the two E plus and E minus uh, eigen, eigenvalues would converge and the eigenstates would coalesce. Now we can write as a special case, uh, we could write a PT symmetric version of this model by simply changing uh, these modes so that now one of them is a lossy mode and one of them is a compensating gain mode with plus I gamma now. Okay, and so that's a very simple, that's a very simple example of PT symmetric model which some people have found actually quite useful in a lot of different settings, both mathematical, optics, things like that. Um, and the eigenvalues in this case are nice because they're very simple. And then it's, it's easy to see, uh, it's easy to see the, the picture for this, these eigenvalues. So when gamma is less than omega, obviously they're both real. When gamma is greater than omega, they are complex. And then that means that gamma equals omega is the exceptional point and it's associated with PT symmetry breaking. So from this picture, then you would be ready to go off in an adventure in PT symmetry, but that's actually not where we're going. We're going in a different direction. So instead we will focus from this point on, on open quantum systems. So the, uh, um, so the open quantum system, I claim it's a microscopic description of the environment in terms of this energy continuum. So uh, what we have here is we have uh, a typical Hamiltonian 
In this picture, we have, this is the discretized part of the model that I mentioned earlier. And then it's interacting with the second term represents the environment. Okay, and EK is the continuum. And then uh, this third term is just the coupling between the two of them. So we see this energy continuum, EK, it has a well-defined range. It extends from some lower threshold, E threshold, up to infinity, possibly. Um, um, now, uh, to get a picture of that, if it, if it seems strange or you feel uncertain what the, what the threshold, what the meaning of the threshold is, just think about the good old uh, finite square well model, right? So in the finite square well, um, at, uh, within the well, uh, within the well, you can have uh, discrete localized states. Those are discrete energy eigenvalues. But at the top of the well, above that, you have an energy continuum. And that's where scattering states are allowed. Um, so the top of the well is exactly the threshold. It's a boundary between the discrete states that are always below and the continuum states that are above. And that's actually a very general picture in quantum systems. Um, now, it's also possible that there could be an upper threshold um, or, or the continuum could go to infinity. It depends on the system. And in the models we'll look at in a, in a moment, there actually will be an upper threshold. So it's like a conduction band or something like that. So then further, there is a well-defined density of states uh, in the continuum. And uh, so this picture is in like a cavity QED context. It's often called a structured reservoir. Um, and uh, then a key point is that it is in this picture, in the open quantum systems picture, it is the interaction between the discrete system and the continuum that gives rise to the complex, uh, to the complex eigenvalues. And so we call those resonances or resonance states. Okay, uh, to get a little more specific picture uh, on this. So I draw this picture. So what I've drawn here is though, so this is some generic continuum here in blue, and there's some uh, element from the discrete part of the system, some level is interacting with the continuum. And so the fact that the energy of this state is within the continuum means that they will resonate. That's where the word resonance comes from. And then the resonance forms as a kind of hybrid between those two different parts of the system. And so then you get the complex eigenvalue and the imaginary part of the eigenvalue then typically gives uh, rise to exponential decay. So that's a well-known picture in quantum systems. However, uh, a full picture of the dynamics is a little more complicated than that for the following reason. Recall, this continuum threshold that I introduced. There's always a lower threshold. And the existence of the lower threshold means that this uh, description, this exponential decay is always an approximation to some extent. It happens to be a very good approximation. However, it is an approximation. Specifically, you can show that there are always deviations from exponential decay, at least on the very shortest time scales on the very longest time scale. Now, if you're surprised to hear that, it's probably because uh, those, uh, those deviations from exponential decay in most uh, experimental circumstances are extremely difficult to detect. Um, however, we'll touch on some cases involving the exceptional point in which those effects can be dramatically enhanced. Okay. I'm actually gonna start with something slightly different. So this is the dynamics at the exceptional point, but it's a different situation than what I just mentioned. So first let's talk about, let's talk about uh, the case, which is two coalescing resonance states. I will call this an EP2B. So EP2, two is because there are two coalescing resonances. B is just uh, chosen for convenience. I will introduce an EP2A later. So now we introduce the survival probability of some initially prepared state, and we'll assume that the system parameters are somehow close to this EP2B. So our initially prepared state, it's some state Q, maybe that's some quantum emitter 
or some atomic level or something, some excited atomic level, something like that. Uh, and then we evolve it in time, project it back onto itself and measure how much of the state exists at some point uh, T in the future. And then uh, in the usual way that we, for pragmatic purposes, actually evaluate this, we usually introduce the Green's function or the resolvent operator here, uh, which is written as an integral of the energy. Uh, sorry, this Z should be an E, sorry about that. Um, uh, but in any case, so it's pretty easy to see that when E matches with one of the eigenvalues of H, then that will give a pole, uh, which then leads to the exponential decay, as I mentioned before. However, uh, when we are at the uh, EP2B, then there is a double pole. And so that leads to uh, a survival amplitude of this form where uh, this, is, this is what we would get, get in the ordinary case from the single pole, but there is this additional linear T term, okay? And so that's a result of the double pole. Then to get uh, an actual physical quantity, we have to take the uh, uh, modulus squared to get the survival probability. So that means in the end, there ends up being a linear T term as well as a, a, quadratic, a quadratic T term. Uh, so we have this power law exponential decay. And so that's typical of this EP2B. Now this basic point was already known uh, in the 60s, but knowing it and detecting it in an experiment are two different uh, uh, concerns, right? So then I'll point out the uh, experiment on the next page. I just mentioned also uh, Marta Raboro's talk on uh, yesterday also touched on this. Uh, okay, so then uh, here is our experiment, which is obviously much more recent than the 60s. So uh, in, this, uh, in this experiment, what the, uh, the authors of this paper did is, so they, uh, they constructed this, uh, this cavity here. And what they did is they divided their cavity uh, approximately in half. Um, but the, in the dividing barrier between the two halves, they uh, introduced the slit S, and they also introduced this little Teflon nub here, and delta, uh, the distance of the nub from the, from the center point of the cavity is, is uh, one of the controllable parameters, and the other controllable parameter is the slit width S. And so uh, what they can do is they can adjust delta and S until they're able to tune two of these resonances together. You can, if you look close, you can see they're almost two resonances sitting right on top of each other. And then they're able to excite the cavity and measure the readout. And then they're able to show uh, this kind of effect, which is exactly the expected uh, uh, power law exponential decay. Now I just point out in a, in a true quantum system, uh, that's basically a classical, uh, a classical imitation of a quantum system, but in a true quantum system, uh, the decay would eventually become non-exponential on the very long time scales. Uh, and we confirmed in this work that yes, that still holds at an EP2B, that's not changed. But again, this would be very difficult to, to observe in an experiment in most cases. However, the non-exponential or non-Markovian dynamics are very pronounced at an EP2A. And so what is an EP2A? So uh, our definition is here. So recall the point that I made earlier, the resonance appears due to the interaction with the continuum. Okay, and I said that's in the case where like the discrete level is the energy is well within the range of the continuum. Uh, however, in the case where it's like below, well outside of the continuum, then you would just get like the discrete, the discrete state like in the, uh, the well of the finite square well, right? However, then it's natural as you increase the energy that the, uh, it's natural that the resonance would appear as you enter the continuum, right? Um, and so that's in fact what happens generally speaking. And so here I've drawn uh, like, a, like a finite conduction band or continuum here. 
And the picture that we have in mind for, the, for this EP2A is that what we find, generally what happens is that there are two virtual states that will coalesce before forming a resonance anti-resonance pair. That's what this picture looks like. Um, now the resonant, uh, sorry, the virtual state is just a real solution that sits on the second Riemann sheet, the complex energy plane. Uh, that's the green arrows. They coalesce and then they form the resonance anti-resonance pair. That's what I call an EP2A, okay? Now, um, due to the proximity to the threshold, the non-Markovian dynamics or non-exponential dynamics are dramatically enhanced uh, in this case. Further, the characteristic time scale for the dynamics is determined by the gap between the exceptional point and the threshold. Um, well, I should say the exceptional point eigenvalue and the threshold. Um, so that's the picture we have here. The EP2A eigenvalue is here, the little dot. And then the threshold gap is given here. And then the characteristic time scale of the problem is just inversely related to the gap. Now I'll, I'll just give a quick uh, uh, example of how this works. So uh, we introduced this simple model, which is a, um, it's a simple uh, tight binding model. And so uh, what we have here is we have a semi-infinite chain in which a particle can hop from one site to the next along the block dots with the tunneling parameter J here. Uh, so this is the, the hopping term along the chain. And then uh, at the end point, there is a side coupled little uh, impurity site here uh, with chemical potential epsilon D in the coupling G. And the variable per, uh, parameters in the system will be G and epsilon D. And, uh, sorry, I should say, and so uh, we can simply introduce a Fourier transform. And when we do, we can, we can partially diagonalize the system. And then we see the, now the tight binding part of the, the chain part of the model is diagonalized. And this reveals the continuum eigenvalue, EK, which is just the usual tight binding, uh, EK equals minus two J cosine K. Now I will actually set J equal to one. We will measure the energy in units of J. So it just takes this form. So what this means is now our continuum extends from minus two to plus two. So that number will appear uh, in our diagrams. Um, and um, um, yeah, so that's our continuum eigenvalue. And then further, we can obtain the uh, discrete eigenvalues for this system from the Green's function method or something like that. And when we do, uh, uh, when we do, we show that there are two discrete eigenvalues given by this expression. Now, uh, to evaluate the dynamics at the EP2A is a bit non-trivial. Uh, so to actually carry out the calculation, we find it convenient to reparameterize the energy eigenvalues as follows. Uh, we, we will introduce this auxiliary variable, lambda, uh, equal to e to the ik. So cosine has a simple form because it's just e to the ik plus e to the minus ik. So it just takes this form in terms of lambda. And then uh, similarly, you can transform the uh, discrete eigenvalues and they end up taking this form. Now, obviously the square root in this case uh, gives the location of the EP2A. In fact, there are two EP2As, one for the lower band edge and one for the upper band edge or threshold. And uh, we will focus on the one at the, the lower threshold, the lower band edge. So uh, in, now in this lambda formalism that I've introduced, uh, you, can eventually, uh, you can eventually map this problem onto the quadratic eigenvalue problem and then solve it and then rewrite it from there. And then eventually you can rewrite the survival amplitude for that impurity state I showed earlier. You can rewrite it in this, you can write it in this form here. Uh, now, if it looks a little complicated, um, Basically, keep in mind, it's basically just a rewritten version of the usual Green's function, that's all. But uh, one advantage is that, um, is that the uh, contributions from the two eigenstates, the 
two discrete eigenstates come pre-decomposed in this uh, expression, that makes it easier to deal with the exceptional point. Uh, also, I'll just mention the contour for this, for this integral. It's just inside the unit circle here. And then the coalescent, the exceptional points happens over here on the real lambda uh, axis. Now, to carry out the evaluation near the exceptional point, what we do is we reparameterize uh, the parameter epsilon d in terms of delta. Delta is the gap between the exceptional point, epsilon d bar, uh, and uh, the, the location nearby. And uh, using that, we can expand the norm. Um, we can expand the norm of the two eigenstates and it just takes this form here. And so notice this first term, the lowest order term, is, as I, uh, as I said earlier, it is divergent. However, the two divergences have the opposite magnitude. So we will apply this into this, uh, into this summation here in the survival amplitude. What happens, uh, as I said earlier, the divergent contributions will cancel out. Further, we also uh, write the PUCU expansion for the lambda eigenvalue here, and we apply that simultaneously uh, with the expansion for the norm. And when we carry out the calculation, we put everything together, we eventually get this form for the survival amplitude uh, near the EP2A when it is itself near the threshold, okay? And so uh, what we have is uh, we notice there's this key term here in which there appears a square root of t. Um, uh, the linear term, uh, this, or this, uh, sorry, not linear, this, uh, this first constant term is just what we would expect. That's just like the ET2b. But this term is maybe a little surprising with the square root of t. The origin for this term is simply, okay, so there's a t e to the minus E0 bar T, E0 bar is the coalesced uh, eigenvalue. So that's just what we would expect from the, from the EP2B case, right? The only difference is that E0 bar in this case is real because it's an EP2A, but um, that's expected. However, there's an additional factor, one over square root of two, uh, one over square root of T. And that comes from the influence of the continuum threshold. Uh, and that can be better understood why that appears uh, in, in this paper. So then uh, we take the square modulus, of course, for the survival probability, and then it takes this form with the square root of t term plus a linear correction term. And then we find that this uh, describes the dynamics very well near the threshold. So these parameters we're choosing, so delta EP is pretty small, one part in a hundred here. And we get uh, this blue curve is the uh, uh, numerically integrated uh, uh, survival probability. And this expression uh, for our expression uh, for the expectation near the exceptional point agrees very well. Uh, then we look on a log log scale to see uh, at very large, what happens at very large times. And what we see is that eventually our EP2A uh, approximation gives way to the usual long time inverse power law dynamics. So this is exactly what I said before. It's when the continuum threshold completely takes over the dynamics and then it just becomes this typical inverse power law. However, a key point is that the time scale separating these two behaviors is like I said, it's inversely proportional to the gap from the EP to the threshold. Uh, so that, that characterizes the dynamics in this, in this model. One interesting point is, so, so we already have this kind of unusual form for the power law decay near the threshold. However, an interesting point is that um, if we back away, so the exceptional point appears further away from the threshold, then uh, what happens in that case is that uh, this long time effect will become more and more enhanced. So in addition to the near threshold dynamics being interesting, the EP2A also uh, offers an opportunity to uh, more closely examine these um, deviations from exponential decay that are, that are interesting. 
Now, after viewing that, one might be suspicious that this picture should generalize for a higher order exceptional point. Um, and so for example, for the EP3A, um, one would naturally expect that there would appear some like T to the three halves, uh, uh, T to the three halves uh, term uh, in the expansion. And so recently, uh, well, we did a, a, a simple numerical uh, example, and this seems to hold true. So now, um, um, uh, yeah. So I take an interim moment here to say. So in part one of the uh, part one of the talk, I gave a definition, and we talked about the basic properties of the exceptional points. Part two, we talked about quantum dynamics near the exceptional points including the threshold influence. Now we move into part three, which is, like I said, is the actual title of the talk. And so that's the uh, coexistence of the exceptional ring and exceptional surface in this doped molecular chain. So now the model that I'm about to introduce here is uh, inspired by, uh, is inspired by uh, these two papers, uh, which is, uh, yielding this uh, recent progress that shows the ability to uh, uh, measure electron spin resonance with almost atomic level sensitivity. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we, introduce this, uh, we introduce this picture. So the model we have in mind consists of, so there's this uh, polyacetylene molecule here, and it's essentially one dimensional. And further, uh, we assume that the, the chain, the molecular chain is very, very long so that it's uh, essentially semi-infinite. Uh, it's infinite off to the right. Um, and so that's actually similar to the model that we looked at uh, just a moment ago, in fact. And uh, then at the end point, we have this embedded donor impurity atom, uh, which is magnetically sensitive. And then uh, we can apply some STM probe, which can be used to charge the, the, uh, the uh, donor atom. And we also assume the, the probe has some intrinsic magnetic moment, so we can apply a local magnetic field. Um, now, uh, so now we look a little more carefully at the different parts of the Hamiltonian we have in mind here. So the, the basic part is the Hamiltonian for the molecule itself. And so uh, this first term, here we have the chemical potential on the donor impurity itself, just, just like before. Um, but actually we'll just choose in this case, epsilon D, just, we'll just set it equal to zero because the magnetic field will be our main uh, parameter in this case. Then uh, we have, uh, like before we have the uh, we have the tight binding uh, chain here, which again, uh, we will diagonalize by introducing the Fourier transform and we get the usual tight binding uh, dispersion, negative cosine K after setting J equal to one. And then coupling between the two here. Uh, the main point is, of course, there is the, the main difference with the previous uh, uh, model is just that now there is this summation over the spin for each of these components. Further then we have the external magnetic field, which is given in second quantized form here, as well as we assume a spin orbit interaction is, is at play uh, with this form here. And we assume that the axis on which the spin orbit interaction uh, uh, acts out is along the Z axis. Uh, and we can make that assumption without loss of generality. And uh, yes. So now uh, to analyze the model, uh, we introduce projection operators. Uh, I alluded to this earlier. So we'll introduce projection operators into the donor impurity sector of the model, the plus and minus the, over the spin degrees of freedom. And then we have the complementary Q operator, which just project is just for projecting out the rest of the model. 
the chain, which after the Fourier transform, you know, takes this form here. And then uh, we can apply the usual Feshbach projection operator technique to obtain our effective Hamiltonian, which is given here. And I just mentioned, uh, so uh, sigma z, this is the, this is the self energy. It, 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 it describes how the chain is, in, is influencing the, uh, the impurity sector of the model. Uh, and is, it's given by this form and it's the presence of the self energy function that, that, uh, that makes this effective Hamiltonian non-hermitian. And so uh, this is, as I, as I alluded to earlier, the uh, presence of the, um, excuse me, the projecting out the environmental part of the system has revealed the implicit non-hermeticity of the open system. Now uh, we can obtain the discrete eigenvalues of the system uh, from the determinant of uh, the determinant of the effect of Hamiltonian. And it turns out uh, it's a quartic polynomial. So there are four discrete eigenvalues and so in this case, I plot them for the case um, that the polar angle is pi over, the polar angle of the magnetic field is pi over two. So that just means that now the, um, the uh, magnetic field is just perpendicular to the, um, to the uh, um, spin orbit axis. And uh, then what we see is uh, clearly there's the EP2A here where two real eigenvalues um, coalesce before forming uh, a resonance anti-resonance pair, just as we said. And there is also an EP2B here, okay? And the EP2B, what happens is like, uh, so you have these two resonances that have opposite um, real part, uh, opposite energies, uh, but the same decay width and so they coalesce before forming two resonances with the same energy, but different decay widths, okay? Now, a key point is that when we tilt the magnetic field so that the perpendicularity uh, between the magnetic field and the um, uh, spin orbit uh, interaction no longer holds, the EP2B vanishes from the system. And that's quite general, but however, the EP2A is maintained. Um, and so that happens for any value of theta b. So that reveals that the EP2b only exists in that special case, uh, theta b equals pi over two. And so what this, uh, what this shows is that the EP2b, it only exists in the bx, by uh, parameter plane of the magnetic field. And so it actually forms a ring in the BXBY plane. Meanwhile, the EP2A forms a full surface in the 3D uh, parameter space of the magnetic field. So we get this kind of picture here, the EP2B. Here we show uh, the two eigenvalues, uh, two eigenvalues coalesce before forming this ring. And the EP2A, there is this fully formed surface in the 3D parameter space, okay? Now, uh, the final uh, point of the talk, uh, we look very quickly at this uh, electron spin resonance near the exceptional point. So um, after the donor site is excited by STM probe pulse, then the spin susceptibility can be inferred. Um, and now the details of the complication of the calculation are complicated. Frankly, it's a bit new to me. Uh, so maybe what I'm about to say is just what you get for this part. But uh, the primary result is as follows. So we have this expression for the spin susceptibility. And then it's written, uh, it's written in terms of a summation over, um, over all pairings of the resonances. And there's this key factor here, which uh, it, contains, um, it contains the norm of these resonance states. And so just like before, the norm, uh, it diverges at the exceptional point, but the different diverging contributions all cancel out. Then uh, uh, in the final result, however, um, 
even though the divergences cancel out, there is still a dramatic enhancement in the vicinity of the exceptional point. Okay, so the double bar represents the exceptional point, and this is on either side of the of the EP. And so, um, and so what we see is that the uh, the peak in the susceptibility is dramatically enhanced compared to the case away from the EP. A further point is that as we pass from one side of the exceptional point to the other, there is a peak flip, right? That happens here. Um, however, uh, the main point is that because there was this uh, dramatic enhancement near the EP, what we have is this, uh, as the, the lingo they use is that it's a giant response near the exceptional point. And so uh, that can be used uh, in theory as like a uh, something that's uh, that has the sensitivity required for like single spin uh, ESR detection. So our conclusions uh, for the early part of the talk, uh, um, we talked about two coalescing resonant states at an EP2B, which gave rise to power law exponential decay. Um, then um, we talked about the case of the EP2A at which two virtual states coalesce to form a resonance anti-resonance pair. In that case, near the threshold, we saw this characteristic evolution with this square root of T uh, uh, term that characterizes the decay near the exceptional point. And this could be used as a way of inferring the existence of the exceptional point that we are actually in its vicinity. Uh, then I introduced the model for the donor impurity embedded in the molecular chain. And after projecting out the environment part of the system, we revealed the effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And we saw there, were, uh, there was an exceptional ring, which was of the B-type exceptional point, as well as an exceptional surface, which was the A-type. And near the EP ring, uh, we saw this uh, giant response in the ESR spectrum. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, I forgot to say this at the beginning, so thank you to uh, Bapani and Manas and the organizers for putting together this conference. I wish we could have met in India for it. So thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, Federico, please uh, just unmute and, and ask your question, please. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Thanks for the nice talk. It was very interesting. I have some question about the first part where you described the tight binding system with the emitter coupled to it. And about this uh, non-exponential decay. So I was wondering, is this a specific uh, result uh, for this, specific, for this uh, specific model, or is it like more general and it can be generalized to some other models? Because I'm more familiar with the um, tight binding where I attach an atom to the middle of the chain and then I go to thermodynamic limit and I don't see this exponential, this non-exponential decay. So mm. that's my I, I I think it should be a generic, I think it should be a fairly universal result for an exceptional point near the threshold um, I suppose, I suppose there could be some kind of exception, let's say for different dimensionalities of the system, 2D or 3D or something like that might, might make a difference, I suppose. But I, I, I claim it's, it should be fairly universal. Um, for the case, um, at least if you, at least if you put the, um, at least if you put the impurity just in the middle of the chain and carry out the same calculation, I know it'll be exactly the same. Now, uh, if you're talking about including like thermal effects and things like that, now that could change things. Um, uh, I was wondering if it depended on, the, on where you put the impurity. Yeah, I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters. I mean, it might matter in the sense of whether or not it's possible for the exceptional point to actually approach the threshold, that might make a difference. Um, but as long as it's as long as it's possible for that to happen, it it should look pretty similar to this, I think. You know, and okay. of course, I add one caveat. Just just 
I guess it's sort of um, at least tangentially related to your point. Um, you know, if we did like a Lindblad formalism a Louis, under the Louisvillian you know, formalism, something like that, mm -hmm. um, it, might, it might become more complicated under that picture, but at least at the Hamiltonian level. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? There is somebody only, else. There is one question in the chat box uh, by Mr. Uh, by Kholil. Uh, can you go ahead and ask this question? Let's see if I can get it. I'm having trouble. Let's see. I can't uh, see. I'm clicking to get um, the chat. Should I read it or, or? The slides around? <clears throat> Maybe Khalil himself could uh, just uh, unmute himself and, and ask the question. Yeah. Would be more directly. Yeah. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, actually, uh, my question come back to the slides uh, six or the previous ones. Uh, normal. Slide six. in a uh, two-dimensional uh, area, uh, general uh, non hermitian area uh, inside uh, this area, we can have the symmetric area, the border of these two areas, uh, in conventional way I am talking. Uh, when you are talking about the exceptional point in general, uh, exactly you mean this uh, meaning or uh, if I want to ask clearly, is it possible uh, having an exceptional point in full uh, PT symmetric area or non-hermitian uh, phase? Uh, I mean uh, PT broken uh, phase. Um, okay, no, you, you, you broke, you broke a little bit, so I, I might not have gotten your question completely right in my head, but I guess what you're asking, is it possible to have an exceptional point within the broken phase of the, of the PT symmetric system? If that is your question, then the answer is yes, it is possible because uh, that would be like the equivalent of what I called the EP2B. So within that case, you would have like uh, like resonances with both having negative part of the uh, eigenvalue would coalesce and things like that. But you sort of broke up, so maybe I misunderstood your question. I'm not completely sure. Yeah, maybe this question can be uh, clarified afterwards. We are a little bit out of time, or for uh, one of the talks will not be given today, so there will be time, but. Uh, for justice compared to the other speakers from yesterday and also for tomorrow, we have a strict time limit of uh, 40 minutes. So it, it would be good to have also future talks, three minutes less and three minutes for uh, discussions afterwards. Okay, maybe we will stop here and you can discuss these things in private afterwards. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much again.